Welcome to Bible Study on Revelation. This is the video on Revelation 5 that is part of this series by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School. I am your host, I guess, host or teacher. I think I have this like little half discussion argument thing every time I start one of these videos because I still don't know um, what I ought to be calling myself. But it's not that important, so we're going to move on. Um, we are stepping into Revelation 5. If this is the first video in the series you're watching, um, I'm going to encourage you to start with, I don't know, maybe Revelation 1 and kind of step your way through. Uh, but if this is where you want to be, this is where you are. I'm not going to tell you what to do, except when I tell you what to do. Anyway, so we're stepping into Revelation 5, and we're kind of, we're, we're stepping out of a lot of this introductory material to kind of quickly sum up the previous videos, the previous lessons that we've gotten out of Revelation. There's a lot of kind of introduction. And then in chapter four, we see John in heaven kind of seeing what the, the scene is there. So that's what we, we're we in in chapter four. And then he steps into chapter five and he's He's describing specific parts of that scene in more detail and with more depth. So that's what we're about to step into in Revelation 5. And as always, as we start to step into the text, I would encourage you to grab your Bible. Or I was going to grab my phone. Nope, there it is. Grab your phone. Open up your Bible app on your phone and navigate yourself to Revelation 5 or again in the book. Because it is a lot easier to follow along, obviously, if you um, if you have the book in front of you. So, we're going to start the first five verses of Revelation 5. It says, Then I saw on the right hand of, right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll? and break its seals. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So, that is the text that we're going to start with. And as we step into this text, in the first verse, we have that uh, in the right hand of him who is seated on the throne, the, this character who is seated on the throne from Revelation 4, this is God. So in God's right hand, he's holding a scroll. And if we think about God's right hand, God's right hand works salvation. We see that over and over again through the New Testament, through the Gospels, that God's right hand is working salvation. So when we see that it's holding a scroll, what, what is commonly understood, and as we walk forward we're going to see more details that lead to this understanding, is that the scroll contains God's plan for salvation. Um, and this reality that as we go, it's, it's sealed. It, it's written within and it's sealed. It, it implies that the plan for salvation is comprehensive and complete. It's extensive, um, that it's it's written all the way through. And when I taught this class in person, there was a bit of a tangent I went on. And I'm going to go on it again, because I think it's a tangent, I guess, worth pursuing. It's not directly connected to the text, but I think it's kind of an interesting side note. Um, in that, at the end times... After Christ comes again, after all of the events that take place in Revelation have taken place, there will be no more gospel. Because there will be no more need for it. Sin and death will be gone forever. So there will be no more need for grace, no more need for mercy. But the law will remain because the law... The law, which we have so many, I think, negative connotations of, which I think are silly, the law is God's will for his creation and for his people. 
So at the end of days, after what is written in this seal is complete, God's law, God's will is still going to exist, but we won't need this. We won't need God's plan for salvation because it will be complete. So that's a little bit of a tangent that we touch on again in Revelation 22. So if you watch through all those videos, or I guess if you skip to Revelation 22, it's there. But So we have this scroll that he's holding in his right hand. It's God's plan for salvation, which we're going to be referring to for the next couple chapters. So if you're taking notes, or if you need to take notes, that might be something worth writing down. Anyway, so this scroll is sealed with seven seals. Now, there are a couple reasons for this. Number one, seven is is a number of completeness. It's, it's kind of a divine number of completeness. You have the seven days of creation. Seven comes up throughout the scriptures, and it's going to come up a lot through Revelation. So there is this kind of symbolism of the number seven as a number of divine completeness. Um, there is also this implication that if it is sealed seven times... This is a secure document. Its content, ca contents are safe and cannot be tampered with. So in, in addition to kind of the, the symbolism of the number seven, the, the seals assure us of the, the safety and the security of our salvation and God's plan for our salvation that no one, is no one can mess with it. And finally, what is really interesting is this connection actually to Roman civil law which John would have been under at the time, he, he would have had some understanding of, Roman civil law sealed a last will and testament with seven seals. So the final will of God, the final point, the final uh, stance he takes on this is one with a plan for salvation for his people of grace and mercy for his followers, his faithful. Um, so he, he's not going to go back on this. He's not going to change his mind and say, I'm just kidding. I'm not actually going to save you. This is his final and abiding will. So that's a, that's a kind of cool connection there. But then, as we see, no one is worthy to open it. No one is capable of opening this. No figure in all creation, not even the angels, because there's this reality and there's the connection here. That no one is able to complete the plan for salvation except for God himself. Which is why Jesus came in the first place. It's why we, we have this gospel. It's why we, we follow him. It's because God is the only one capable of following through on his plan for salvation, of opening this scroll. And he does. That is what Jesus Christ does. And this, we're getting at the whole point of the book of Revelation here. It is a final pointing toward and summary of Jesus' ministry, of Jesus' gospel for us, his forgiveness, his grace, his mercy, his mission. So that's what we have when, when, it's, when the elder intervenes and he says that someone can open this. Um, this is one of two times in the book of Revelation that an elder intervenes. And, and like we talked about in Revelation 4, an elder doesn't really ever refer to an angel. When the word elder is used, it refers to a person. So probably one of the saints in heaven. Um, and what's really interesting is both of these times that the elder is intervening, it, it occurs when the vision is closest to to redemption and salvation. And we ask, well, why is an elder conveying this message? Why isn't an angel whispering in John's ear? Um, and that's a discussion I would encourage you go ahead and have in the comments. I, I'd be interested to see what you think. But a couple reasons that I, I recall coming up when we were in person and when I posed this to a, a group of people sitting in front of me was... Um, that there's kind of this connection, this identification of, oh, John says, oh, I'm a person, and a person is communicating with it. Like, when angels talk to people in the Bible over and over again, the, the first comment is, don't be afraid. But, so there's, I think there's some level of comforting presence that it's another human. Sorry, my nose is a little itchy. Um, so there's some comfort in that. 
but then there's also this comfort in that um, it's a saint. It's someone who has on some level already experienced God's grace and mercy. So there's, I think those are some of the reasons it might be an elder. But what's interesting is I, I think this, this points to our task today as Christians to point to Christ. You see, because you don't have to be an angel. You don't have to have some supernatural special abilities to point people to Christ. You can just be a person. Um, so, I guess a little bit of a tangent, but mission is one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, and I'm not talking about, like, mission, go to a different country and do something for a week. I'm talking about uh, the people that you work with and, <clears throat> and live next to and your friends and family. Um, sharing the gospel where you are. So... Anyway, moving forward, it says, Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered so he can open um, the seal. This is a, a reference, you can go as far back, this Lion, um, in Genesis 49, is this kind of prophecy of the Lion of Judah. Um, lions are typically symbolic of royalty and power. But this is a great opportunity for us to remember that when we're speaking metaphorically about God or about anything divine, our metaphors are imperfect. For example, we use the lion here, the lion of Judah, to describe Christ. And we, we have these, uh, these images that come to our mind of royalty and of power. But there's another part of Scripture that describes the lion or the devil as a lion prowling around seeking someone to devour where it's predatory. So our, our metaphors rely on different aspects of these things that we're more familiar with. But it, it's it's a good reminder to say our, our metaphors are imperfect. And we, we can't take them too far. We can't stretch them beyond their limits. Um, so there's it, it's, a, it's an interesting discussion, but here we have the Lion of Judah, especially referring to royalty and power, as is typical of the House of Judah. And then there's this reference, Root of David. This is calling Christ as uh, a fulfillment of promise and prophecy to David. That's how it's addressing him. And what's really cool is that both of these titles touch Jews and Christians alike with their meaning. To Jews, this would have spoken to the prophecy. But then there's still this, this touch for, for Christians of the lion is still an accessible metaphor. David is still an accessible persona. But both of these draw on those Old Testament prophecies of the Christ. So that's what we have in these first five verses. And then it continues specifically in a description of Christ. And we see that in the next three verses in Revelation 5, verses 6 to 8, where it says, Between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So, um, the, the Lamb is in the midst of God, in the midst of the elders, kind of uh, uh, in and amongst them, which I think is kind of cool because he has this direct connection to God, but he's still kind of in, and in the midst of his people. Uh which is consistent with our descriptions of Christ as our mediator that are also found throughout the New Testament. It says this lamb, to be clear, the, the lamb who was slain, that's Jesus Christ. That's, that's who it is. Um, but it says he has seven horns. And what is interesting here is that a horn especially in, in the Old Testament, is a symbol of power on earth in human affairs. And we talked a little bit earlier in this video about how seven is a symbol of, of divine completion. So when the Lamb has seven horns, when Christ has seven horns, it's conveying a totality of power on earth in human affairs, which is really cool. Um, and this actually connects back to Daniel 7, verse 7, where, 
where ten horns are supreme power exercised by humans in human affairs. And using the number seven instead of ten here in Revelation points to supreme power over all things because it's the number of divine completion. Um, walking forward, we then have seven eyes, which it, it says right here, it's the seven spirits of God. We referred to that back in chapter one. This is a reference to the Holy Spirit. So all of this, this is Christ working with the Holy Spirit in all authority and power. And he goes and he takes the scroll. Uh, the scroll contains the message to be revealed, and we're going to walk through what that looks like in the next couple chapters. It talks about the reign of Christ, and, and what we're seeing here is Christ is being handed the plan for salvation for God's people. And that's the plan that he lived out, that he, he died on behalf of, and that he lived again for. So that's what we see here. He takes the scroll, and then everyone bows down. Holding, a, uh, holding harps and golden bowls full of incense. Incense, like prayers, rises up to God. Um, it's not a practice that's super common. There are still churches that do incense. They burn incense. They, they swing censers full of incense around. Um, and it's symbolic. Uh, or a lot of people take it symbolically as rising up, or the smoke rises up like the prayers of the saints to God. And this is a practice that goes all the way back to the Old Testament, to the to the practices in the temple and the tabernacle. Um, fun fact, though, in several modern places, in, in the Christian church especially, um, the tradition of incense doesn't actually directly trace itself back to the Old Testament practice of incense burning. Um a lot of it traces back to the fact that people didn't shower as frequently, so when you gathered them all in a building, they kind of smelled bad. So they burned incense so that the building wouldn't smell as bad. So if you're really attached to the tradition of incense and you think, oh, we trace this all the way back to the Jews, there's a connection there. But the reason that the Christian church started doing it was a little more um, practical. Anyway. Complete tangent. Sorry about that. So, that's what we have in these next, in in 6 to 8. We see Christ taking the plan of salvation in hand, and, and the hosts of heaven are praising him for it. And with that, we step into, I want to just step into the next two verses where it says, in, in verse 9, it says, They sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. So, this is worship of Jesus in highest glory, all about his work for us. And there's a really cool connection here in verse 10. It says, uh, God has ransomed people for himself from every tribe, language, people, and nation. This language is, is really closely connected to the Great Commission in Matthew 28, which is not an optional thing. If you, if you do not think mission is important, if you do not think mission is a driving force in what the life of a Christian, what the life of the church should be, you are wrong. If you are sitting in your church, you are satisfied with just worshiping and going to your Bible study and not trying to reach out to anyone with the gospel, you are called to do better than that. You and I are called to reach out to the people in our lives who are not connected to the gospel of Jesus Christ, who are not faithful to Jesus Christ, and bring them before his throne. That is our call in Matthew 28. And if you can't tell, I'm pretty serious about this because I know there are people out there who try and talk their way out of it. Is it no? We're we're just wait. We're we're waiting for the clock to run out. We are called to go and make disciples of all nations, so that every tribe and language and people and nation can be here. Our mission is to go out and bring people into this community of the saints in heaven. And, and what brings us into that community together? It is, it is the blood of the Lamb who was slain. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people. 
He ransomed you, he ransomed me, he ransomed everyone who is who follows him. That is literally the only requirement, is that there is faith. You don't have to earn it. Um, so this, this is, again, this is the core of Revelation, is, is Christ's salvation for his people. Um, and then it goes, you have made him a kingdom and priest to our God. Um, we've talked about this before. This is not talking about an earthly kingdom. As far as the scriptures are concerned, God doesn't really care a whole lot about our earthly kingdoms. America is not God's chosen nation. God cares about the people that are faithful to him, that are in his kingdom, which is not of this world. So, we have that. That's a little bit of a tangent. Um, anyway, so to the, to the next two verses of Revelation, verse uh, 11 and 12 of chapter 5, we have, I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. So th this one's pretty quick to step through. Myriad of myriads. A myriad is actually, it's 10,000. Um, so we're, we're getting at millions of angels. Is that a specific number? I don't know. It doesn't really sound like it. Um, it's, it's just saying a, a lot of angels. Um, and they're singing. They're praising the Lamb who was slain. This is Jesus. And there's a lot of symbolism in this title of the Lamb because it is, it goes back to the Old Testament, to the sacrificial system. Uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So they sacrificed a lamb. And Jesus, who was the perfect lamb, was sacrificed. And with his shedding of blood, there is forgiveness of sins to all who believe. It's not a sacrifice that has to be repeated over and over again because it was a perfect sacrifice. And if you want more details on that, I would encourage you to go look, uh, check out Hebrews. Because the, the author of Hebrews um, gets it that really, really digs into that lamb connection, the connection with the Passover and, and stuff like that. Um, so, and then we move to these seven blessings of, of power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. That's seven, seven blessings. I can count, I promise. Um, seven, again. Uh, symbolizing fullness, and we have that here. Um, so, with that, we're going to step into the final two verses of this chapter, verses 13 and 14, and it says, I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that's in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing, honor, glory, and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. So, who's not worshiping? No one is excluded from this. Everyone on earth, and in, so I guess those in hell are not included in this number, but everyone in, in any part of the earth or in heaven is covered here. Everything is worshiping and all that is in them. So the question I want to leave you with, and this is what I want to end our Bible study on, is if... All of the, if, if all of creation is praising God, why don't we do it with our daily lives? Why do we do things that, that dishonor his name? We're identified with him as Christians. We, we ought to be acting like it. We ought to be showing our neighbors love and empathy and always giving them the benefit of the doubt and being kind and, and peaceful and joyful and gentle and all of the fruits of the spirit. We should be epitomizing this. We should be worshiping him with everything we do. So that's the challenge I have for you uh, with this week, this video session, um, however you're watching them. So that is where we're going to close on. Um, thank you for your time. I hope this was helpful for you. If it was helpful for you, go ahead and give it a like so that we, we know it's been worthwhile. A um, little bit of ego stroking, I guess. Uh, if you are interested in more of the things St. Paul does, especially if you're a visitor to the page and this is kind of your first interaction with us, um, this page is managed and run by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida, and there is a lot of content that we do. We have live worship services, we have daily devotions, we have Bible, we have the Revelation Bible study. There's a Bible study that Pastor Andrew is doing 
on kind of the foundations of the Christian faith and, and what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be faithful to God. So we have that. Uh, he has eight videos of that out so far. So that, well, actually, I guess nine by the time you're watching this video. Maybe even more, depending on how late you watch this video. But as of time of release, there will be nine videos in his Bible study out. And, and we have all kinds of other stuff. We have stuff from our school. We have, it, it's, and if you're interested in any of that, if you want to be connected to that, I would encourage you to go ahead and subscribe to this channel um, up there and or down there, I guess, because there's a button under the video, but then there's also going to be a link in the top of the video toward the end. So that has been Revelation 5. I'm done with the shameless plugs. Uh, brothers and sisters, go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.